Thank you, Jerry and Pam, for an extraordinarily lucid presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, and I ask anyone who has a question to come to the mic and uh, identify themselves. Hi, uh, I'm Bob Donahue, and uh, I had a, I don't know if you've seen Grey's Anatomy, uh, but uh, there's a recent episode in, in Grey's where uh, uh, two physicians had to come with an end of life decision, and, uh, and the spouses fought over this decision, and, and, and both your mindsets are quite different, and, uh, and I'm, I'm wondering how much does, uh, if you have different mindsets, how does that going to play when you have to come up with a decision? So if Pam is making, Jerry is not able to uh, think of, uh, or is on some medication or something that doesn't permit him, can you make a Jerry decision? or vice versa. It's, it's a dynamic I just don't really have a handle on. Thanks. So I want to emphasize that the, the mindsets are a starting point and, and you can move back and forth along this spectrum. Um, in the book we talk about a patient who started as a believer and had a bad outcome, felt he was misdiagnosed and mistreated and then became a doubter but then had, to, had a, developed a, a cancer, had to have a bone marrow transplant, and, and for, for a doubter to have to have something like that is probably the toughest thing because they're always doubting and doubting all these interventions that are happening to them. So I just want to point out that, that circumstances can change your point of view, so that's first. And secondly, as far as whether I would, for example, be able to make a decision for him or vice versa, I would say that the understanding of another person's mindset is, is the first step. And whether that's the right mindset for the particular problem is something that you then need to decide. Uh, let's go here to this mic and then Hey. So um, when you think of uh, end of life counseling and how we wanted to, uh, in the Affordable Care Act, add a physician a compensation for having this discussion. And there was such vehemence when we, uh, death panels, you know, and um, I was a volunteer at a free health clinic and there were patients who actually believed that death panels existed. So how do we cut through the rhetoric, the political divide? Uh, people wanting to assert their independence, which is like the American way, and really get this communication to the masses so that we can ha have these informed decision-making processes. I think we hear it well. I'm sorry. So the question is, if you, um, how do you deal with accusations about death panels when you're having these type of discussions? It's, it's more um, when we have this political divide, people who want independence don't want physicians to be telling them what to do. So the death panels are the example. This uh, mm -hmm. physician is trying to tell you or trying to communicate to you what the end of life count, or trying to have this discussion about end of life counseling and people are like, I don't want to have this discussion and because someone has told them that that's uh, the physician right. trying to lead you to this death panel. Um, shall I answer? Okay. So um, not everybody does want to have these discussions and, and obviously you need to be sensitive to that. Um, sometimes it's just not the right moment to be asking and another time would be better or another way might be better or even just not specifically talking about end of life but maybe just you know the person's point of view during life can give you some helpful insights. I think you know understanding what happens between um, a physician or or any healthcare clinician who's interacting with a, a patient, it's, it's not something where a script is, is all that useful because people are different. Their point of view is different, their goals are different, their understanding is different, and it really needs to be individualized. And that's one of the sort of distressing things to us about 
algorithms, for example, about how to discuss end-of-life care. You know, first you say this, then you do that. It's, it's not the way to go about it. So I wonder if, if you would comment uh, about what uh, many of us with gray hair were taught, that when there are, that no two patients are identical, and when there's a problem of a decision to be made, it makes sense to get all of the people involved in the process, I'm now talking from the professional standpoint, uh, the internist, the surgeon, to get them all in the same room and to discuss the same issues rather than merely rely on printed words that get circulated around electronically and so forth. So my question is, in your studies, was there any indication as to the influence of this intercommunication directly with multiple types of physicians and the patient? And the decisions that were made. Is there a role for this in the process? Did you hear the question? Talk about thyroid with the, um, um, go ahead, you, you go ahead. So um, I think, uh, as I understand the question, um, is there a role for bringing together all the people who are caring for a patient to give their points of view and, and, and trying to come up with a more unified or, or, or nuanced uh, presentation for the patient. Would that be correct? Yes. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, I think that um, first is that uh, we found heterogeneity. So there are, um, you know, as you know, there are multidisciplinary, say, within a tumor conference. And you will have radiation therapists who generally uh, will favor their approach uh, in the context of, say, prostate cancer. Uh, surgeons who tend to favor their approach. And to my knowledge, there's never been a head-to-head -head comparison of these two treatments, despite the widespread prevalence of, of prostate cancer and the different Gleason scores and ages and risk factors and all the rest. So often, um, you, you need someone who can help interpret for the patient and also to some degree mediate or guide and, and we think that's where we found the, um, the mindsets to be helpful to give a structure um, in terms of maximalist, minimalist, and so on. We also found incredible depth of cultural differences, which usually were glossed over within the routine medical care. For example, in Pam's specialty, treating hyperthyroidism, Right. So what he's referring to is a study that um, for treatment of hyperthyroidism, surveying endocrinologists in different countries. So in the United States, radioactive iodine is by far the preferred treatment, whereas in Japan, um, probably based in part on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they almost never use radioactive iodine. They don't trust it. And in Europe, somewhere in between. So, so that's another layer of um, sort of difference in how um, uh, recommendations might be, by, might be made. But I think you were also trying to get at sort of interdisciplinary care and team care. Is that the other sort of question? So, um, and, and I think that it's incredibly valuable to have interdisciplinary care, to have everyone together in the room explaining their point of view because for the patient, one of the most distressing things is when you come in and they say, well, the surgeons were in and they told us this, but then the infectious disease came in and they told us something else, and then cardiology said, oh, no, you shouldn't do either of those things. This is something else. So, so that's a really bad situation for patients. And having a, everyone together and expressing their point of view, you may not come to a consensus, but you'll at least understand. I think we have time for one more question, so I'll go to this yeah. mic. Well, thanks. I really enjoyed the lecture. Um, but your framework, to me, seems it's almost innate about your being, whether you're going to be a believer or a doubter or this or that. And I've always been uncomfortable with uh, these black and white type issues. And I myself perhaps consider myself a, a realist. I don't know. I can see believers and doubters both being fools. Um, and that, <laughs> you know, it's, 
you're informed every day about new things and you're constantly changing your mind or you're better informed about things. And you, you speak of doctors being, you have to be understanding of the patient's mindset, but that patient just might be wrong. And, 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 and so does your framework allow for this fact that anyone can go back and forth in a given day, depending on how much information right. is given? You just mentioned about the iodine issue and people. And right, Japan. very much. So I think um, one of the points Pam made, uh, th this is a spectrum. These are axes mm -hmm. which provide categories. And people move. They move along these axes, as do doctors. And um, in terms of being wrong, I can personally give an anecdote and end of one where I was having terrible back pain when I was a marathon runner and I was hell-bent sure that there had to be a surgical solution for this. And I was turned down by two very good orthopedic surgeons and I found a maximalist who said, oh yeah, you know, we're going to operate on you and you're going to be running marathons in three weeks. And I never ran again. It was such a disaster. So it was clearly the wrong mindset on my part. And, you know, a doctor doesn't need to be a rubber stamp in this way. It's complicated. Um, but also it gets so complicated <coughs> that uh, Kahneman has done all sorts of studies looking at people's evaluation of their own well-being through the day. So if your granddaughter comes to visit you and you're hospitalized getting chemotherapy for lymphoma, you will, at that point, when you've seen your granddaughter who brought you a blueberry muffin, right, you feel great. You'll evaluate your life much greater than two hours before when you're alone in your room feeling isolated and frightened and abandoned and thinking that you'll never see your granddaughter again because you're going to die from this. So this is really complicated, um, and I think that it speaks again to this, the rigidity is not, we don't see the rigidity, the rigidity is in these algorithms and so on, which can be suggestions, guidelines, rather than mandates. This is when it's futile, or this, it, this is hard. This is what quality, of, this is what value, everything is value now, right? There's an imperative now to pay for value. The Institute of Medicine just came out with a report, and guess what? The, the opening line was, we really don't know how to measure this or define it. To my mind, you would want to say we need to pay for something when you know what that something is. But that's not the way it's been presented. So now how are we going to measure this in a meaningful way? And it's not easy. Because it, it varies tremendously from individual to individual, and it's a dynamic process, as you point out. So on that note, uh, for, I thank you enormously for bringing some clarity with useful concepts to this conceptually complex and confusing space. Uh, thank, so please join me in thanking Dr. Stephen.